So I'm going to just start off with a little bit about the solar system, just to remind you about what planets are, and, uh, and then uh, what exoplanets are, and um, just deal a little bit with, or a little with, uh, methods of finding extrasolar planets, uh, with reference in particular to methods that are used at Sutherland at the present time. So what is a planet? Well, in, in its wisdom, uh, <coughs> the infamous decision made by the uh, IAU in uh, 2006 uh, <coughs> uh, tells us that, that, a, that, that a planet is a, an object that orbits the sun, it's massive enough to be round, holds itself together, uh, <coughs> it's cleared the neighbourhood of debris, and uh, is not a satellite of any larger object. So this was the definition that uh, was agreed at the IAU in 2006. And then there were uh, another category called dwarf planets, and it was essentially the same as this, except that it hadn't cleared its neighbourhood of debris, and then there were lots of uh, other little bits and pieces which were really the debris. Uh, this is just to remind you of the solar system. We have this inner system here, we have the asteroids, uh, larger planets on the outside and the Kuiper belt outside of that. And uh, the size is the, to scale but not the distances and you see the, the planets are all pretty round and uh, so that looks pretty good. They satisfy the first requirement and they go around the sun, we're pretty sure about that. And then we have these uh, tiny little jobs here which are the dwarf planets and um, even some of the asteroids make it into that size category. And uh, <clears throat> these are some of the, uh, the dwarf planets, the, the trans-Neptunian objects. You see they're sort of starting to get a bit, uh, bit wonky, a bit out of round perhaps. But, um, and they're all very small by comparison with Earth, say. This bit about clearing their neighbourhood uh, of debris is, is a significant one, and uh, here we have the asteroid belt. This is the inner solar system, so you see the planets here are in a pretty, pretty clear space by comparison with the, with the asteroids. There's a lot of uh, debris and rubbish there. Jupiter has done a pretty good job of clearing its space. It's massive enough to have some attendants on either side that uh, precede and follow it in its orbit. But basically, uh, um, all of these planets obviously satisfy this requirement of clearing their neighbourhood. We move to the outer system, then here's Jupiter here uh, with its attendant uh, asteroids. Um, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune all have also pretty well cleared out the space in between. And then we have the Kuiper belt, and poor old Pluto sits somewhere in, in here. And it obviously hasn't managed to clear its, its space. So those who really thought that uh, planet, uh, Pluto ought to be demoted sort of obviously went for this as a good argument for, uh, for demoting it. Uh, at the IAU this recent time in Beijing, I came across this uh, rather interesting way of displaying uh, the distribution of planets uh, and other objects in our solar system. It's divided up into three groups, the hot, hot region, sort of close into the sun, uh, an intermediate sort of warm region, which is here, and then the cold outer region here. And you see the distribution of objects. There are these um, Neptune, Uranus, Jupiter and Saturn sit out here. The Earth and Venus and Mars are here. Well, they put the moon here as well. Uh, well, of course, it's all objects in the solar system. You've got this whole bunch of objects, 73 of them, which are, which are moons of planets uh, or uh, also trans-Neptunian objects. And um, Mercury sitting down here in the hot zone close to the sun. I just want you to try and remember that because we'll come back to a similar plot later. I'm just going to go over that. So uh, we've established what a planet is as far as the solar system is concerned. The, the, the problem with extrasolar planets is there isn't particular agreement about what an extrasolar planet is. There is a kind of uh, informal agreement that um, the mass 
Uh, since we are not going to be able to see them very well, if at all, we're just going to detect their presence, we can measure things like their mass. The mass is pretty well the main determinant of whether you've got a planet or not. The reason for this uh, 13 Jupiter is that um, this is the minimum mass that a gas cloud can have uh, uh, and burn deuterium in the core. In other words, the minimum mass you can have for anything that uh, generates energy in the center and, and appears uh, um, uh, self-luminous. At 75 Jupiters, then uh, hydrogen burning turns on and um, you've got a full blow, proper star. In between 13 and 75, you've got brown dwarfs. There's nothing particularly magical about this number. Um, if you plot the, the distribution, the numbers of objects with mass, then there isn't a sort of a bump or a cut-off or anything like that at 13 Jupiters. This really depends on how you think this object is formed. Is it a gas cloud that's condensed and uh, under gravity, and um, so then it's going to be limited by how much matter it has as to whether it's self-luminous or not. Or maybe uh, it, 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 it uh, grew the other way and started off as a small bit of rock and that attracted some more and that attracted some more and it's, it grew slowly. So maybe uh, it's quite likely that this process could get you well beyond 13 Jupiter masses and still not be self-luminous. So, it's a very grey area and um, when you come to look at the numbers of pla extrasolar planets that have been discovered, you have to remember there's this considerable uncertainty about exactly what they are. And also, uh, it's been decreed that they not be free-floating, that is, a, it's not just an object floating around in space, not attached to a star. But such objects have been found and um, and they're called extra, extrasolar planets by those who are in the business. So, um, but officially they're not supposed to be planets. Well, how do we go about finding them? There's a variety of methods. Um, we could try to take pictures. Of course, this is extremely difficult because of the, the contrast between the, the parent star and the planet, which we only see by reflected light. So the ratio is about uh, um, a billion. In, in brightness, so it's rather hard to do, but people are beginning to do it. Um, it's very really hard to do from the ground. Um, there are the dynamical methods, which depend on the fact that uh, a planet in orbit around uh, its parent star is going to tug the star about. The two of them are going to be trying to move around the common centre of mass, which will not be at the centre of the star. And so uh, the star itself will appear to, if we looked at the orbit of this planet uh, edge on, then the star would appear to approach us and recede from us, and this can be measured. Uh, uh, we can measure the radial velocity of the star. If we looked at the orbit uh, face on, then there's no velocity, there's no coming, approaching and receding, but the star itself will appear to move in a small circle around about the, the centre of mass. And this is, this is measurable by measuring the position of the star with time. It's exceedingly difficult to do from the ground. Uh, there have been claims of detections of planets, but none of these has held up. We really have to wait for, for a spacecraft to, to, give us, uh, to make us independent of the Earth's atmosphere, which is really what causes all the trouble. Photometric methods, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about these two eventually. Um, uh, I I for transits, we're looking at the parent star, and the planet goes in front of the parent star and, um, and uh, um, blocks a little bit of the light. So the photometry of the star, measuring its brightness, that is, uh, should reveal the presence of the planet. Microlensing. Uh, um, simply uh, depends on a, a background star acting as a kind of lighthouse or a, a light source to tell, to reveal the presence of a star, uh, of a planet associated with an object in between this background star and ourselves. Um, timing, the very first planet uh, that was uh, um, <coughs> confidently, uh, <coughs> that was verified 
uh, as belonging to, uh, as a, a first, very first extrasolar planet was detected by this timing method, uh, it was associated with a pulsar. The pulsar was acting as a clock, or a, <coughs> a regular clock, and again, because the planet and the pulsar were both rotating about their common centre of mass, the pulsar was closer or further away, and so the pulses were early or late, and so uh, that was how that one was detected. But any kind of uh, object that varies regularly, like a, a variable star or an eclipsing binary, um, can act as that clock, and by detecting variations in some aspect of this clock, then uh, one can detect the, the presence of a planet. Po uh, photometry, um, <coughs> polarimetry hasn't really been tried by anybody yet, it's too hard. Well, this is the story as it stands right now. Well, as, if you remember what I said about uncertainty, if you look at some other collection of extrasolar planets, you will find that there are 839, actually. You can believe whichever one you want, but um, it depends a lot on, on, on what your criterion is for including them in, in, in your catalogue. This is from NASA, and, and one of their criteria is that you should have published your result in a peer-reviewed reviewed journal uh, and not just announced it at a, at a conference, say, uh, which uh, a, lot of, a lot of transit events have only been announced at, at conferences and they, are <coughs> and they have not yet been finally verified because it's a very, very difficult task to do to, to uh, actually verify that a planet is, is there given that you found the transit. <coughs> well, you can see, uh, well, the first planet was found in 1992, these, these pulsar planets. This guy over here was a very uncertain result, which was only verified later, once people became uh, able to do rather more accurate radio velocity measurements, but it's now included in, in the list. Um, and you see that what's... Initially, radio velocity methods were the, the, the way to find extrasolar planets. And <clears throat> around about 2007 or so, um, transits began to take over, and you can see the relative contribution of transits is growing quite steadily. Um, in some sense, it's rather easier to do than uh, <coughs> radio velocity, but... Um, uh, it's, essential, it's, an, it's necessary eventually to actually do radio velocity measurements to make sure that you have a true a planetary transit rather than some other false positive. There are a number of ways that you can get a signal that looks like a transit and, and yet is not. Now the distribution of, <coughs> of masses of these planets with period is very interesting. You see the red, the red points of the radio velocity measurements Lots of Jupiter and above masses. This is the mass, this is the period in days. Uh, lots and lots of massive objects. And the reason for this is pretty obvious in that the more massive the planet, the better it can tug its star around, and so the easier it is to measure. So in the early days, it was much easier to measure. Uh, precision uh, of measurement has increased uh, as time's gone by. And this bottom edge here is essentially given, determined by the precision with which people can measure velocities, which is about one meter per second, uh, <coughs> which is whatever it is, three and a half miles an hour or something like that. Very, 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 very small motion, but um, it is possible with uh, <coughs> modern spectrographs. And SALT is awaiting the arrival of the high resolution spectrograph early next year and it will be able to, in, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, measure at this kind of precision. So that is one of the programs that will probably be done there at, at Sutherland. Transits, the green points are all short period, very close in for the parent star because for a transit you've got to see the, the orbit edge on and the chance of that is really quite small and you have to, the closer into the planet you are, the, the greater the chance that you, you're going to be uh, seen uh, um, moving across the face of the star. 
the purple, the magenta points out here are, are, are obtained by imaging. And you see there are long periods, which, in other words, they're very far away from their parent star. And it's necessary, as I said, because of the large contrast between the star and the planet, and special means have to be uh, applied in order to detect them uh, in the glare of the bright star. Microlensing is very interestingly different from all the rest, that it, its uh, region of <coughs> discovery is almost orthogonal to the rest, and it is the only way at the moment in which one could detect an Earth-like planet at uh, one astronomical unit from its parent star. You can discover transits of Earth-like planets, which are right down here somewhere, but they, they're extremely close to their parent star and uh, very, very hot and very, very <laughs> uncomfortable, I imagine. Well, here's, here's another diagram showing the, showing the uh, <coughs> confirmed exoplanets. And you see the number is 839 here, according to this catalogue. <coughs> rather, a rather different story from the solar system. Um, <coughs> And um, you've got a very large number of objects in this really hot zone. They're really close to their parent star. A lot of them were discovered by transit, so they had to be really close. A very large number of very large objects, Ju Jupiter mass or, or above, um, because uh, you need something large to tug the star around so that you could actually measure it very well. There's nothing, nothing really in the Earth mass region yet. There are some things that super Earth that are getting close. Well, okay, planetary transits, as I've told you, that basically what you're doing is measuring the brightness of the star and you're watching for uh, uh, reductions in brightness as, a, as the planet moves in front of the star. Um, uh, you, you don't have to read all of this, but basically it's a very productive method in the sense that you can find out quite a lot about the planet by, from a transit, like the radius of the planet, its distance from its parent star, the inclination of the orbit, which you don't get when you're doing radio velocity me measurements. There's always this uncertainty about the inclination. Uh, if you do a radio velocity measurement and you know the mass of the star and the inclination, you can find the mass of the planet. And with the mass of the planet and the radius, you can find the density of the planet. And that report about this um, <clears throat> diamond star relies entirely on the fact that the density that was found for this object is so high that the only thing that could possibly have a density that we know about, a density like that, is diamond. But it in no way tells you that it really is diamond. <laughs> it is, there could be other explanations for this at the moment. That's, that's, that, that catches the headline, so that's, that's, that's what it is. Here's an example of a transit. This, this is a particularly clean light curve. It was obtained by the Hubble Space Telescope, so it didn't have any problems with the Earth's atmosphere. You see that the dip is only just over 2%. So uh, you're really struggling to measure this from the ground. It's quite, quite hard. From space, it's really very easy. Uh, and it's so easy that even uh, in, in, the in, the, in the middle of the transit, you can see their structure. This is the difference between a model and the actual observed light curve. And you can see this kind of structure here. And that's actually due to uh, spots on the surface of the star. So the, tra the planet is actually giving you, sort of mapping out the surface of the star as it goes along. And the fact that the green one and the blue one are different means that the spots are different on two different occasions when this light curve is obtained. It's about, it's a bit less than the Jupiter mass, but pretty hot, 860 Kelvin on the surface. Now, uh, we can use diagrams like this in order to say things about what kind of planet we've discovered. This is the mass of the planet, this is the, rad this is the mass, this is the radius of the planet. And these are models that people have derived, these lines, for different compositions of planet. And up here you have the, the gassy gas planets. And 
Jupiter and Saturn fit quite nicely in amongst these models. Uh, here we have icy planets with a very thin atmosphere and uh, Uranus and Neptune sit here. And the Earth and Venus are down here and the model says that they made a pure rock which is pretty well what they are. And when you put some measured planets on here, these red diamonds up here fall in amongst the the gassy planets and so we've got a fair idea that they are indeed just like Jupiter and Saturn. Here's one that's like Saturn very close to, here's one here is very similar to Uranus and Neptune and it's probably made of ice and so we don't we, we only know these things by the uh, proximity of their data points to the models that we've made in the same way as uh, that planet could at the moment only be explained by being made of diamond. At Sutherland, uh, transits are being measured by telescopes like KELT, which uh, one of my students is working on. This is owned by Vanderbilt University. This is the telescope. It's simply a, an ordinary camera lens and it's got a, an Apogee camera on the back. It has a field of view of 26 degrees by 26 degrees. It's a pretty large swathe of sky. It gets about 100,000 images, stars on, that, on each image. And basically what it does is just set, centers, sets on a field and takes endlessly, takes 150 second exposures while the field is visible. About 80,000 of those images are usable, uh, uh, stars are usable on any given image. Uh, these are just the, the fields uh, of view. They're pretty well concentrated in the south. They avoid the Milky Way because the star density is too high. That's what a 26 degree square, 26 by 26 field looks like. You can see you get both the Magellanic clouds in at the same time. This is uh, <coughs> the, the only... The, um, Kelt South has a, has a twin in the north called Kelt North and this uh, planet was discovered by Kelt North. Here you see the data and here you see the dip due to the planet. There are 8, 7,837 observations included here. You need a lot of observations. You can see the scatter just due to measurement error. It's quite difficult and you've got to observe for a very long time, get lots of data in order to be sure that um, you have an object here. Its name is Kelt 2 ab which means that it's actually a planet going around the A component of a binary star. So there are two stars and one of them, the A component, has a planet going around it, which is these are just confirmation <coughs> observations, so that's quite interesting. The other experiment uh, pursuing transits is SuperWASP. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a bank of eight cameras on a very substantial looking mount. It's in this roll-on, roll-off structure here. Um, very recently they've changed the camera lenses. They've made them smaller. They've put <coughs> filters on. These, this, this is a, a red filter with an interference coating, so it looks rather, rather peculiar. Each camera has a field of view of 18 degrees by 18 degrees, and they're just marginally overlapping, so a very large fraction of the sky is covered by any given exposure when you tap all of these. are looking at different places, so they're side by side fields, um, adjacent fields, so they cover a lot of sky at, at one go. Um, here are a couple of examples of, of planets they have found with the existing, the previously existing camera. Um, <coughs> I, I, <coughs> again, I, I, went, I can't remember the details of these, but um, they, they have claimed 79 discoveries so far, mm -hmm. so this has been a very very productive um, <coughs> that, uh, telescope. They have a, a, an equivalent telescope in the Canary Islands in the north, so between them they have discovered 79. But something like 18 to 20 of these have yet to be confirmed as, as, as real planets, so uh, we have to wait and see. And of course I can't avoid mentioning Kepler. Kepler has revolutionised the, the transit field 
Um, they've just been granted a four-year uh, <coughs> extension, so it's now a seven and a half years instead of three and a half year mission. Um, in, in three and a half years, they reckon that they could find an Earth-like planet at one astronomical <coughs> unit from a, a Sun-like star. Because in three years, you'd get three orbits, you'd see three transits, so you'd be sure that you had a planet. But the sensitivity of the equipment wasn't quite as high as they thought, and there were problems of one kind or another. But <coughs> it was so successful that they, they persuaded the powers that be that um, more money should be spent. But <coughs> at the expense of involving the community much more, so it's no longer a kind of more, more or less closed shop where they work on their data, they, they encourage the, the contributions or the involvement of uh, other people. And, um, and of course Kepler has its own diagram. It, it, at, at present there are 2,320 candidates and they're distributed like this. Now we're creeping into the Earth-like planet zone, so they're beginning to find objects that are uh, similar to Earth. You have to look very carefully at this because they've, they've confirmed zero out of those one possible planets, only one out of 27 possibles. It takes a long time to, to convince everybody that you've actually found a planet. Still, there's plenty of material to go on and um, they'll undoubtedly find more, but, and, and as time goes by and their techniques of, of processing their data in, improve, then they'll probably push, uh, uh, find more objects down in this kind of region, which was the whole purpose of the, of the experiment. All right, I'm going to move on to microlensing. I haven't got, really got a lot of time, so... Um, microlensing uh, depends on uh, the deflection of light from a background star by an intervening mass. So it's a general relativistic effect. It's the effect of gravity on light. <coughs> Einstein recognised that this was, a, this was possible and uh, treated it in some detail. He, he decided with the information available at the time that it was unlikely that you'd ever be able to observe it. In the meantime, uh, technical advances have, have made it possible to observe many more stars than he, he thought were observable and um, increase computing power. We can measure millions of stars with very high precision uh, in, in almost immediately after obtaining an image. And it's now possible even to produce models based on the data that you've got so that uh, you can pick on the objects that are most promising for finding planets. So this is the idea. You've got a, a star here. Somewhere along the way there's an object. The light from the star goes off in all directions, but this particular bunch of light is affected by here, by this object here with some mass and, and ends up down here on the Earth. Similarly, if you go this side, same kind of thing happens. So somebody on the Earth would think there are two images here, there are two objects, the, an image up here, an image down there. And then if this object has planets, then you'll get some extra uh, <coughs> effect on the light caused by the planetary system. And so by measuring the light that you see, then you will uh, be able to say whether there's a planet there or not. We, to get really high numbers of stars, we look in the direction of the galactic center. This is the edge, of, this is the galaxy edge on, this is the bulge. So if there's a source, a bright star in the background, and there's a lens on the way, then this is what happens, the light gets beamed to the sun over there. This is the kind of star field that you have to deal with. It's pretty crowded. Uh, this just reiterates what I said, this is where, the way the light is deflected around the lens and you get two images. If you look end on, the images would look like this, rather funny looking pancake things. The separation between them is typically a, a milli arc second and you cannot resolve that kind of separation and so basically you'd see the combination of these two and since the area of these two is greater than the area of this and surface brightness is conserved then uh, this would look brighter because of this lensing effect. 
But then if it's a static effect, you wouldn't really know that it was going on. But of course, everything in the galaxy is moving with respect to everything else. So now we have our lens here, and the source is moving along here like this. At any position of the source, you've got two images, one on this side, one on that side of the lens. And as the source moves along, then you've got this one image runs around the outside of this circle and one of them runs the other way around. And it's the sum of these two images that we can measure. It turns out there's a very simple formula for the application, the brightness increase depends only on the dis distance between the lens and the source at any given time. If you can do the sums in your head, if you find, if you, if U is very large, in other words, if the source is down here somewhere, you'll find that this goes to one. So there's no effect whatsoever, the amplification is always one. If U is very small, then this goes to one over U. And if U goes to zero, this goes to infinity. So the effect gets stronger and stronger the closer the source is to the lens. Just to illustrate that again, depending on where you're moving with respect to the lens, you'll produce a light curve like this. When you're closest to the lens, the amplification will be a maximum. And on either side, it'll be going up or down to the maximum. If you never get closer than this one, you never get brighter than this. What does happen, though, is that this that the duration of this event is, is pretty well the same and it turns out the duration depends on the distance to the lens, the distance to the source, the mass of the lens and the speed of the lens with respect to the source. If you, could work, if you knew all these other numbers you could work out the mass of the lens. Even though you could not see the lens you could tell what its mass was. And This is the power of this method. You don't actually have to see the object that you're measuring in order to get some physical information about it. Typically, these light curves last 30 to 50 days, and, uh, but uh, for, a, for, a, for a star, for a stellar mass, but if you had a Jupiter, it would only last for one day. So, given that, you've got to observe the star as, long, as frequently as you can, and so we, we set up this network called Planet, and we had telescopes at, in, in Hobart and, and Perth, the SAO one metre and a Danish 1.5 metre telescope here. And then we have these two groups called Ogle and Moa who tell us that events are underway. And once we know about an event, then we can just follow it as it goes around and around, uh, day after day after day, we get the light curves. A lot of other people have joined in in the intervening years, and this is the situation now. Here's SAEO. I think this is Berto Monard here, and uh, when he was when he was in Gauteng. This is uh, the Wise Observatory in Israel. It's a bit off the map. Uh, this bunch here are mostly amateurs. In fact, people, you can you can join in this exercise. You can do this kind of photometry on a lot of events. Uh, people have uh, telescopes as small as 30 centimetres here and it goes up to telescopes like two, me uh, two metres at the Forks Telescope south and north which are, will be, which are now part of LCOGT that Billy was telling you about before. And LCOGT will actually start up this exercise. One of the, one of the things they will do at Sutherland is, is to follow microlensing events. Well, it really happens in practice. Here's a real event. Uh, with contributions from South Africa, uh, uh, Australia, and uh, South America. And you can see it, it follows, and, and the dotted line underneath is, exact, is a theoretical light curve, and it fits perfectly the, the theoretical light curve. Well, uh, we're talking about planets now. Planets, planet plus a star is a binary, really, and when you've got a binary lens, you get a much more complicated light curve and you get, can get a whole range of different kinds of light curve depending on how the source star in the background goes through the, the region around the, around the binary. And we describe it in terms of these funny looking curves here which is called the caustic. If you had a point source and it hit this caustic, the, inf the amplification of it, uh, it, it, it would be infinitely uh, magnified. 
but since uh, stars are not point sources, then it doesn't go to infinity, but you get a very large increase in brightness as you go across these caustics. The shape depends a lot on the separation of the planet from its parent star and also the mass ratio of the planet to the parent star. You get caustics like this, this, just all sorts of rather strange things. But it does allow you to find planets. Here is the first planet that the, the planet group found. You've got an event underway, it looks just like a normal microlensing event and then it goes up to magnification of three. But on the way down there's this funny little blip here which you see lasts about one day and this is really the signature of, of a planet and so we were able to determine that in this case we had an object which had a five earth mass planet its distance the planet was th about three astronomical units from the parent star so you know a bit further out uh, of the order of, of Mars or a bit further um, and um, the parent star was a rather less luminous, less massive one than the Sun, but nevertheless uh, it still managed to have a planet. And these light curves can be really complicated, all sorts of different peculiar shapes and behavior, like this kind of really strange thing here. But you also see the very large number of people who, who get involved in this kind of work. It's very exciting when you're observing and you can see this kind of thing this light curve unfolding before you. Uh, unfortunately, it takes a long time, though, to analyze such an event. Um, uh, just recently, um, uh, well, basically what you've got to do is you have a model in which there are up to 11 or 15 parameters, and all of these are, can be allowed to vary in, in any kind of way you uh, feel plausible. Um, one of our colleagues was asked to include an extra two parameters in a recent uh, modeling exercise and he set one of his students going it took two weeks on a processor with 480 cores so you need super massive super computing power in order to deal with these things to get uh, a good uh, fit to, to the observations and to determine what the planet characteristics were the significant thing though Planet was set up in order to determine the frequency of occurrence of, of planets uh, um, in, a, in a region rather far from our solar system. And um, I don't have really time to tell you all about this, but basically the most important thing is this. This is the frequency of occurrence that we determine for planets of different masses. So here's uh, here's an Earth mass, Uranus and Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter, just to give you some idea what this scale means. And this is what we found, is the distribution, the frequency of occurrence of planets of different mass. And you see it's heading rather steeply upwards at, low mass, at the low mass end. If you want to know how many planets there are, this, this assumes one planet the frequency depends on an assumption that at the beginning that there'll be one planet per, per, uh, per star. And um, if you integrate underneath here, you'll find the total number of planets you can expect uh, associated with stars. And, and what we found was that, on average, there were 1.6 planets for every star in our galaxy. So it's saying that every star that you look at, you could expect to find at least one planet. This is really, really encouraging if you're in the exoplanet business because you know that you're bound to be successful if you try hard enough. And so, <clears throat> what uh, uh, this sort of drives the, the whole project onwards. What we're doing now is just sort of building up statistics, adding more and more examples, reducing the error bars, which are the dotted lines about here, so that we we know rather better what's going on. And I want to just end up with this final thing to do with pulsar timing. This is the idea. You've got a, a pulsar here beaming pulses at the Earth and pulses arrive <coughs> uh, um, regularly shown by these dots here. Now if you've got a planet then the pulsar is, uh, is rotating 
about the centre of mass, the plan planets rotating about the centre of mass. At some stage, the pulsar is close to you, and the pulses arrive early. So you see the spikes are coming before they ought to, where the dots are. But gradually the, the pulsar is going around here, and eventually the arrival time is more or less what you expect. And then the pulsar moves around here, and then the pulses become late compared with the dots, so they arrive after. And this is the variation of arrival time. And from that you can determine the, 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 <coughs> the mass of the planet that's there. Well, this is where Solaris comes in. This is what they're trying to do. But they're using eclipsing binaries as their clock. They're eclipsing binaries. You've got one star going around the other. There's no, uh, in, in most cases, there's no interaction between the stars. So the period should remain particularly perfectly constant. And again, what you do is you measure the time of, uh, of each eclipse. And then if there's a planet... Uh, associated with the system, eclipses will occur early or late, and by by um, doing this over a long time, you, you'll be able to find out uh, the mass <coughs> of, of the planet associated with this binary system. So that's the purpose of these funny-looking domes. One of them will do photometry, one of them will do spectroscopy in order to follow up on the velocity variations also associated with the uh, with, the, with the system. And then sometimes you discover things by accident and uh, Steve Potter and his, and his colleagues uh, were observing uh, an eclipsing uh, um, cataclysmic variable, a polar, which is a white dwarf plus a red dwarf in orbit uh, with a period of 126.6 minutes. This is pretty quick. Uh, the white dwarf has a very strong a magnetic field, matter goes from the red dwarf onto the white dwarf and you get hot spots on the white dwarf and um, uh, when you have an eclipse then first of all the spots are being eclipsed and then the white dwarf is being eclipsed but the important thing is you measure this, the, the, the time of the centre of the eclipse, the mid-eclipse mid time and when they plotted that against time over a period of um, 27 years, they found there's cyclic variation, which is completely unexpected. Uh, it has a period of 16 years. When they took away this, uh, removed, subtracted this line from the data, they found that there was still some periodic behaviour, and they could explain that by something that had a period of 5.25 years. When they took that away, there's pretty well nothing much left, it's just noise. So, the model that fitted the data uh, called for two planets of about seven Jupiter masses, one with a period of 16, one with a period of just over five years, orbiting this object, which was itself a binary object. So, this was completely unexpected, and um, a, a, a handful of these things have been discovered now where you have planets orbiting uh, th this kind of um, uh, 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 cataclysmic variable, although uh, there is some dispute about whether it's real. It depends a lot on what you believe about the model, whether you can think of some other way of, of producing this kind of effect. Well, I'm going to stop there and, uh, and let you go back to sleep again. <laughs> Yeah, um, the, at the risk of uh, not being impressed with fantastic work already, um, the signals that you're getting from these exoplanets, is there any way to tell about possible biological processes? Is that a, is that a resolution thing? Or? Yes, no, no, it's a, it, it involves uh, using completely different techniques, and I was concentrating on what we can do at Sutherland at present. When the high resolution spectrograph comes along, it will take spectra of these objects. Now, when the planet moves in front of its parent star, then if the planet has an atmosphere, say, then the light from the star will shine through the atmosphere and leave an imprint 
the atmosphere will leave an imprint of its composition on the spectrum. And so it will be possible to tell. As has happened already, people have discovered this with other uh, transiting objects, people with, other, with big spectrographs, have found uh, uh, atmospheres with oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide in them. And um, it, it really uh, um, is, a, is, a, is the way this subject is going. Mm. Uh, the, the whole point of, the, of finding more is to find brighter ones, closer ones. That's what the great value of KELT and SuperWASP are. That's partly why SuperWASP is moving to smaller cameras, to brighter magnitudes. The brighter an object you can discover, then the better the chance of finding out much more detail from spectro spectroscopy about the, the character of the planet itself. Mm. Thank you. One more question, please, sir. Um, in terms of the nature um, of these exoplanets, um, besides whether they're a diamond or not, I'm aware of a study at the um, University of Melbourne looking at the reflected uh, Earthshine on the dark side of the moon. Yes. And using that kind of information to try and infer what the nature of the planet is. And yes. by studying that Earthshine on the moon to try and then infer what we are maybe seeing on exoplanets. Yes. That's, that's essentially what I was just saying. What they were doing there was using light that shines through the Earth's atmosphere, reflects off the moon, comes back to the Earth, you train your spectrograph on that, and by comparing it with a spectrum that you take pointing in the other away from the moon, or pointing at the moon uh, um, when it's bright, then you can see an imprint of the Earth's atmosphere on that spectrum, and so you can treat Earth as an exoplanet and see what you could find out by using this technique. Indeed, that is exactly what's happening, yes. And we hope to be able to do that here and when SALT gets up and running with its high-resolution spectrograph. So maybe we have to thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.